All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. So wonderful to have you all back tonight. So you, you all came back for part two. I got your curiosity up. Now, what would you say if I decide to change my mind and do something else? I just got you in here. No, I'm not going to do that. So hopefully it will be worth your while uh, tonight. But we, we do really have some serious things that we need to talk about that have happened recently. Very, very disturbing. So we'll, uh, Lord willing, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, on our continuing prayer list, as we announced this morning, uh, Fanny had gone to the hospital with a severe nosebleed. She's still doing okay? I saw her. We saw her today, and she's doing better. Doing better. So that, that's good. That's good. Um, Keisha's uncle Harper is still hanging in there, but they're expecting him to pass at any time. So obviously, uh, Keisha and her family going through a lot uh, with that situation. So please pray for that family. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Uh, I told you about this morning, Bobby, not only did he fall, but he's also sick. Uh, he had been throwing up, and uh, but anyway, his uh, Rita, his daughter, told me a while ago that he was doing some better today. He's still not doing well, but she said he's doing better today than he has been in the last couple of days. So we're we're thankful for that improvement, but still keep praying uh, for Bobby. Uh, brother Ernest asked us to pray for his brother Millis Jackson, who kind of kind of like Keisha's uncle Harper is expected. <clears throat> to pass at any time. He, I haven't talked to Ernest this afternoon, so that may have already happened, I don't know, but please pray for the Jackson family that there would be some comfort in that situation. Uh, let's continue to pray for Jacqueline. We're so thankful that she's back, but pray that this surgery will help her somehow and she can get some relief for all the pain she's had. And Let's pray for Cheryl that theoretically is supposed to have surgery on Wednesday if the weather cooperates and he needs to get that done so he can get some relief. So let's pray that they're able to do that on Wednesday and it's successful and things go well with him. Uh, reminder once again that Sweetwater is going to be holding an area-wide singing uh, Sunday, January 28th. That'll be at 3 o'clock. You might get to hear Brother Steve lead some singing, maybe. He will. So, so that's worth the price of admission right there. So maybe you can go up and support that. All right, so we're going to turn the song service over to Brother Cheryl uh, for our opening prayer. Brother Steve will lead us in our opening prayer here in a few moments. Brother Lane has our dismissal prayer at the conclusion of services. So, Brother Cheryl. Hey, evening, everybody. Hey. Let me get you a song book and turn to number 10. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender
if you would be turning in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, we'll be looking there in, in just a few moments, the book of Ephesians. So this morning we started looking at the subject, the topic of deceptive messaging. And that goes on in a lot of areas in the world, but of course our focus is on religious deceptive messaging, false religious ideas that are plaguing uh, the world that we live in. And so we said we were going to talk about three examples today of a recent nature. And so we looked at two this morning. We looked at this idea that Jesus is coming soon. And we've seen this message around here. And we looked at the the notion that we don't know. He may in fact come soon, but we don't have any idea, so we cannot be telling people that message. We need to tell them exactly what the Bible says, and that is we don't know. What we do know is he is coming at some point, and so we do need to be ready for that. And then secondly, we looked at this idea of Jesus is the reason for the season. We talked about the falsehoods of Christmas, how it was a pagan holiday, and we need to understand that God does not want us to focus on the birth of Christ. God wants us to focus on the death, burial, and resurrection. That is the memorial that we are commanded to observe, not a memorial of his birth, but of the death, burial, and resurrection. And those are the things that we looked at this morning. And so we focused on those two things because we said that some of these false messages are done by honest, sincere well-intentioned people that they just maybe they have an ignorance of the scriptures they just don't really know what the bible says and so they inadvertently put those messages out there thinking they're doing a good thing but as we said it's misguided well the one we want to talk about tonight we cannot chalk this one up to well-intentioned ignorance of the scriptures. There, there's no way that this comes from that position. This is much more sinister and this is much more deliberate, done by a supposed religious leader. A few weeks ago, the leader of the Catholic Church, this man pictured here, a man by the name of Pope Francis. He helped to perpetuate this third false message that we want to focus on tonight, and that is that God accepts all types of relationships, that nothing bothers him, it's all good, it's all fine, as long as love is involved. And so about two or three weeks ago, again, which really prompted, among those other things, me putting together this lesson, Pope Francis declared that priests, Catholic priests, can now bless homosexual couples. At the same time, this decree that he issued states that in spite of that blessing, he still claims that marriage is in fact between only a man and a woman. So at first that sounds a little confusing, and it is, and we, we want to focus on that in a few minutes. But this doctrine, this, this decree that he issued said, well, we, we still believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I'm sure that keeping that doctrine is probably only temporary. Because it is clear, and it has been clear for some time, and you, a lot of Catholics will tell you this, it has been clear for some time that Pope Francis wants to move the Catholic Church in a very different direction than it's really ever been. And he wants to move it toward eventually approving of homosexual marriage. That, that's really where he wants to go. This is simply a step in that direction. So we want to ask the question tonight, the Pope has issued this decree that priests can bless same-sex relationships. Well, what is wrong 
spiritually speaking, biblically speaking, what is wrong with that decree? Well, I hope you've got some time tonight. Where do I start? This is wrong on so many levels. It's hard to know where to even begin. Because I know when that came out, just all this stuff starts racing. Through. Yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And so I had to organize and kind of put this thing together. And so I've put what we want to look at tonight is just some, I think, the main objections that you can come up with. There are probably more, but I know you don't want to be here all night. So I have several biblical objections, not my opinion, biblical objections to what the Pope, who is the, the religious leader, supposedly, of hundreds of millions, maybe a billion people on this planet. So let's look at some of these objections tonight. So first of all, and these are all pretty equally <coughs> important, no particular order, but first of all, we want to notice that when a man or a woman, for that matter, when a human being a mere mortal who, as they say, puts his pants on one leg at a time like everybody else, has to breathe like everybody else, has to eat like everybody else. A mere mortal, a sinful human. You saying the Pope is sinful? God said all men are sinful. That would include him. But when a mere sinful mortal claims to be the head of any church, This is what you get. Because we are told in God's word, if you will look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, we are told in God's word that Christ and Christ alone is the head of the church. Not the Pope, not me or anybody else. Ephesians 5 and 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Plain and simple. And he is the savior of the body, which again is the church. Christ is the head of the church. Staying there in Ephesians, look at chapter 1 and verse 22. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and hath put all things under his feet, the feet of Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Christ is the head of the church. Over how many things? Over all things. There is no other head. He doesn't share authority with the Pope or anybody else. Christ is the head of the church. That's not what the world says. That's what God says. It's what the Bible says. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 18. We reinforce the same idea. But again, how many times does God have to say it to make it true? Colossians 1 and verse 18. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Once again, all things. Christ has all authority. He doesn't share that authority with Pope Francis or with me or any other supposed religious leader. Christ shares authority with no one. We are to look for him, to him for our spiritual authority. So any church that has a human being, a man or a woman, any church that has a human being as the head in the place of Christ, because you can't have two heads of the church, so in the place of Christ, any church that does that is a false church. I don't care who it is. That may be unpopular to say in today's culture, not maybe, it is. And depending on who watches this, y'all, some people are going to blister me. That's okay. 
It's not, a, it's not popular in modern culture, but it is the truth. We just read. We saw this morning. Where's the truth? It's in the Bible. What did the Bible say? Christ is the head of the church. No man is the head of the church. What I'm telling you is not my opinion. It is God's truth. It's unpopular, but it's the truth. So that's one objection we have. Well, secondly, this decree that Pope Francis laid out, it is in direct opposition to what God has already declared. God has already issued a decree about this and everything else. It's right here. This is God's decree. And Pope Francis has just issued one that directly contradicts what God says in his word. God has clearly condemned homosexuality as being sinful, along with a whole lot of other things. And we do tend to rank things as, well, this is worse than that. Hey, if something is sinful, it's all bad. But homosexuality is one of those things that God has said he does not accept it. It is not pleasing to him. Now, just some examples. We're not going to go read these but because we've, we've preached sermons on this before. But just a few examples where you will find, okay, well, where does God say that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. God talks extensively about this. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. God talks about this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. God talks about this, where he condemns homosexual behavior. Now, one of the arguments you will get when people try to justify this behavior, they'll say, well, well that, you know, that was Old Testament stuff. I mean, Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus didn't condemn homosexual. That's all Old Testament stuff. And there's a lot about it in the Old Testament. But did you notice those three references I just gave you, where they're at? They're all in the New Testament. Okay, yeah, you can go to Leviticus. There's a lot of places in the Old Testament where God makes it plain that homosexuality is not acceptable to him. But you'll get that, well, Jesus didn't talk about it in the New Testament. Uh, that's a lie. It is mentioned several times in the New Testament. And let's look at what Jesus said. They'll say, well, Jesus didn't address it. Yes, he did. Look at Matthew 15 and verse 19. And there are other places too. This is just one. Again, how many times does God have to say it to make it true? If God condemns something one time, what does that mean? It's condemned. If God says something is righteous one time, that means it's righteous. But especially if he says it a bunch of times, you know, but some people, it doesn't seem to matter how many. But notice what Jesus said here. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Evil means sinful, things that are against God. And then he gives examples of this. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Now, the word we want to focus on here is fornication. And you all know, I'm sure, you may have known before I even told you, but I've told you many times in this pulpit, we all know the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in Greek. The New Testament, the Old Testament, and Hebrew, it's written in Greek. So the Greek word that has been translated as fornication, our English word fornication, well, it comes from the Greek word porneia. That's the word that's in this verse that has been translated as fornication. Well, that might look fairly familiar to you, as you would imagine, the word porn pornography, right? So it's talking about sexual immorality. That, that's what this is. Now, I want to give you the Greek definition for this word. So when they translated it, this is where this comes from. So the Greeks define this word pornea as, quote, unlawful sexual intercourse generally. Illicit sexual intercourse of every kind, end quote. That's the definition of this word. Thus, when again, you dig deeper and you do more research, what did the Greeks consider would fit under that word? If you want to compare, it's like an umbrella. And so that term porneia describes 
several different things. They all fall under that umbrella. Well, what things fall under it? Well, all of the following things. This includes, like I said, it's really it's sexual immorality of any kind. So this would include adultery. It includes homosexuality. It includes premarital relations. It includes bestiality, bisexuality, bigamy, polygamy, and prostitution. All of those things fall under this Greek word pornea. And Jesus condemned it. So that includes homosexuality. It's one of the things. They said, well, Jesus didn't say it. Yes, he did. Right here. He didn't specify that one because he was saying, look, any kind of sexual morality is wrong. It's a sin against God. All of those things are sins against God. It's what Jesus was saying. All these things are unlawful according to God. If we participate in any of those things, we are violating the laws of God that he has established. Now, a few months ago, we did another sermon it's kind of similar to this when we had the whole Amy Grant fiasco. And I gave you then a quote from a denominational preacher, a man by the name of Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham. And Franklin Graham and I, no doubt, we would disagree on quite a few things, but he's all over it on this topic. And I showed you then, he had an excellent response to what Amy Grant had said about this particular issue. Well, he came out with a blistering response when the Pope came out. And like I said, this only happened about two or three, it was right around Christmas. He came out with, again, a great quote, which it's hard to say it any better. And one of the points I hope to make is that if a denominational preacher will speak up about this, what should members of the Lord's church be doing? We need to speak out against it. Not because we hate anyone, because we want to promote the truth. And we want to make sure people understand what the truth is. So we cannot refuse to speak up if Franklin Graham's going to stick his neck out. Because I, I know what he said wasn't popular with a lot of people. So let me show you what he said, among other things, but this is the quote. He said, Pope Francis has now approved Catholic priests blessing same-sex couples. But none of us, including the Pope, has the right to bless what God calls sin. So-called blessings from religious leaders like Pope Francis will not save them from the judgment of God. See, because they think it will. That's the sad thing about all this. this. He is misleading so many people. And Franklin Graham is calling him out on that. Said, you, you're convincing them that this is okay and they're going to be just fine and they're going to be saved. And that's a lie. That's a lie of the devil. This sounds just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, right? Phony religious leaders making people think that they were spiritually safe because, hey, I'm following up the Pharisees and they're the religious leaders, so I must be okay, right? Phony religious leaders making people think they're spiritually safe while all the time leading them straight to hell. It's just like that. And we know from our study of Matthew, but all through Jesus' ministry, he spends a lot of time calling them out. Man, it's kind of, boy, you're kind of coming down hard on these people. Isn't it kind of hurtful and hateful? And Jesus did it. Because it's got to be done. Because souls are at stake. So two objections. Well, let's look at the third objection. We want to look at the Pope's justification. How does he defend contradicting what God says? Because that would be interesting. And, and he did try to give an explanation. But his justification, what it shows, it demonstrates a total, utter, complete disregard for what God has said. He apparently doesn't care what God said. He thinks he can overrule God. That's clear. So one of his quotes when you know he's questioned about this, 
well, you, you can't bless that. I mean, God said, you know, this, this is bad. And, well, the Pope said, who am I to judge? Who, who, who am I to judge? Right? I just got to let people do what they want to do. Well, I would respond if I could talk to the Pope. Of course, he's not going to talk to me. But if I could talk to the Pope, I would respond by, okay, you said, who are you to judge? I would ask you, who are you to change God's word? Who am I to do that? Who is anyone to do that? Apparently you think you can do that, but you can't judge anybody? He said that homosexuals should receive blessings without going through, and I quote, exhaustive moral analysis, end quote. We don't need to put them through exhaustive moral analysis. Well, I, again, I gotta ask you, what, what's so exhausting about it? God said that what these people are doing is sinful. It is wrong. It is a transgression of his law. God's already said that. You can't be blessed for doing that. Doing anything, whether it's homosexuality, theft, whatever it is, you can't be blessed for doing that. It's very simple. There's nothing exhausting about it. God's already decided. God is all about righteous morality. But the Pope, what he's saying by this is that morality doesn't matter. Who am I to judge somebody's morality? He is saying, in other words, it's no big deal to commit a mortal sin. Not a big deal. So, can we judge? You say, well, we, we can't judge. Yes, we must. Now, what you'll get here is, again, a lot of people, oh, they're going to they're gonna go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. A lot of people know nothing about the Bible. Buddy, they know that verse. Right? Have you read the rest of it? Well, no, but no, but nothing. You gotta read the rest of it. Right? Matthew 7 and 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. And Jesus said that. They, aha, see, <laughs> it's right there. Jesus said we can't judge anyone. Yep, he said that. But he also said a lot of other things. See, they stop reading right there. You don't even have to go that far. Jesus was talking about hypocritical judgment. He wasn't talking about all judgment. How do we know? Well, I'm going to show you that in a second. Prove it through the Bible. But he was talking about hypocritical judgment, right? Jesus, if you continue on, Matthew chapter 7, that was verse 1. Just, just go down to verse 5. In Jesus' word, he kind of explains what he meant in verse 1. And, but notice in verse 5, Matthew 7 and verse 5, thou hypocrite. See, that's what he's talking about in verse 1. Don't be a hypocrite. Right? I don't need to condemn you when I'm doing the same thing. But look at verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. So you've got to get your own life right. But keep reading. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Right? So that requires a judgment. You have to make a judgment that there is a moat in your brother's eye. That's a judgment. So Jesus is saying, yeah, you can judge your brother, but clean up your own act first. Then you can better help him. He's not going to probably let you help him if you're doing the same stuff. He's not going to listen to you anyway. But if you're trying to be righteous, then you've got a better chance to reach somebody else. So Jesus is not saying don't judge because that right there requires a judgment. Now notice, continue on. Sorry, I should have already put that up there. John 7 and 24, same chapter. All you've got to do is just keep reading. Don't stop with verse 1. Look at verse 24. Jesus said, judge not according to appearance. Hey, let's stop right there. Hey, let's not. Let's continue reading. But judge righteous judgment. See, Jesus said that too. 
judge righteous judgment. So if I interpret verse 1 in this chapter to say, I can't judge anybody for any reason, then how do I reconcile verse 24 with that? Well, I can't. They would contradict each other. Okay? But verse 24, notice he says, judge righteous judgment. So what is verse 1 talking about? Unrighteous judgment. Hypocritical judgment. Yeah, he said, yeah, don't do that. But we have to make a judgment. If I see you steal something that doesn't belong to you, can I not call you a thief? That's what you are. If I see you kill somebody in cold blood for no reason, can I not call you a murderer? That's what you are. What requires a judgment? Okay? So think about it this way. If we can't judge anybody then that means what I'm doing, what I do all the time, and what you all hopefully are doing too, teaching the gospel, we can't do that. That requires judgment. How am I supposed to decide that you or somebody else needs the gospel? I have to make a judgment. So Jesus said, I want you to go out and teach the gospel. Because they're a lost soul. That's a judgment, right? So if that's true, then I can't teach the gospel to anybody because I'm assuming that they need the gospel. That's a judgment. See, so it's foolish. It's, well, we can't. The Pope said, who am I to judge? Give me a break. We all have to make judgments, but they need to be righteous judgments. And we've we got to have our own life together. That's what Jesus wants to do. And if you look back at Pope Francis's record, Oh, he's judged plenty of people. So it's funny that all of a sudden now he can't judge. It's like, buddy, you've been doing it the whole time you've been in that office of yours. You've been judging a lot of people. And he's doing it right now because of this very thing. He's kicking some of the priests out who won't go along with this. Well, that's a judgment. So what he should have said, of course, that would give away his bit. Well, I can't judge on this matter because I don't want to. But I can judge on something else. You disagree with me, I'm going to judge you as being wrong. Right? It's he himself as being hypocritical, which is what Jesus told us not to do. So finally, let's look at one more objection, one last objection tonight. And this is the idea that what the Pope has done has caused a lot of confusion. And not just among Catholics, and there's a lot of confusion out there after this, because I've been reading, I've been doing some reading, I've been reading a lot of it. And a lot of Catholics are, wait a minute, but it's, but, but I, I don't, you know, a lot of confusion among them, but not just them, a lot of other people too, who say, well, the Pope is supposed to be really spiritual, really religious, and yet the Bible says one thing and he says something else. What, what am I supposed to make of that? So he has caused a lot of confusion among many people. We'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's look at verse 33. God does not want religious confusion. In fact, he will not tolerate it because there's no sense in that. There's no reason for it. There's no need for confusion if we would just do what the Bible says. There would be no confusion about this issue or any other spiritual issue. God said it. That's it. There's no debate. Oh, no, but we can't do that. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion. His word is clear. He does not contradict himself. So who is the author of confusion? mankind, including Pope Francis, but unfortunately he's not the only one. We are the authors of confusion, not God. Because as we stated a few minutes ago, the Pope, in this decree, he reaffirmed that, well, you know, marriage is between just a man and a woman. Well, nice of him to agree with God on that one. You're right, because that's what God said. Genesis 1, 27, 28 says that. Genesis 2, 24 says that. Matthew 19, 4 through 6 says that. And other places. 
Man is between, a marriage is between a man and a woman, period. That's it. There's no debate. There's no discussion. Because that's what God decreed. So it's nice of him to admit that, well, yeah, that's, we still believe that. Well, good, because God said it. Whether you believe it or not doesn't matter. God said it, and that makes it true. I better believe it, but even if I don't, it doesn't change it. It doesn't make it not true because I don't believe it. So he acknowledges that, but at the same time, he's willing to bless homosexual couples. What does that mean exactly? Well, in, in Catholic doctrine, if they bless, what does it mean? A blessing means that their church is signaling that these people are actually behaving correctly in the sight of God. That's what it means. That you are practicing homosexuality and that is correct under the sight of God. God's okay with it. That, that's what it means to bless them. So in effect, what we're seeing is the Pope is willing to bless sinful relations. Well, then why stop at homosexuality? Again, you could bless murder or anything else, couldn't you? Now, when you look at Catholic doctrine, and that's I'm not saying that it's, it's right. I'm just talking about within the church itself, which this man claims to lead. If you even look at their doctrine... Their doctrine has always held that any sexual relations outside of marriage is sinful and must be condemned. And yet the Pope is saying, we're going to bless these relationships. And he himself said, well, they can't get married because that's a man and a woman, but we're going to bless. Well, then you're condoning their physical relations and they are outside of marriage and your own church's doctrine forbids that. Of course, God forbids it. We just talked about that, porneia. So they got that one right too. But the Pope is violating his own church's doctrine by doing this. Because they are in agreement with God on that. Again, how nice. Glad that they agree with God on that one. But again, the Pope is, is he's willing to bless these sinful relationships. Well, does God speak on somebody who would do such a thing? Yes, he does. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 32. God has something to say about those people who condone the sins of others. Romans chapter 1 verse 32. Notice what the Bible tells us here. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things, because he just talked about a lot of different kinds of sins, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now notice this. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So God is saying, it's not just the people who commit the sin, but if you applaud those people, if you encourage those people, maybe you're not doing the sin yourself, but you're approving of them doing it, God is saying you are worthy of death. In other words, he's saying that is sinful. And we're not even always talking about physical death. It's not about spiritual death. Your soul will be lost. You may, well, I'm not committing the sin. No, but you're encouraging those others who are. And God is saying, you know what? That makes you just as guilty as the ones who are doing it. Take a look at the book of 2 John. There's only one chapter in 2 John, so that's not chapter 10 and 11. That's verses 10 and 11. 2 John, verses 10 and 11. Notice what God tells us here. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine. Whose doctrine? God's doctrine. Anybody comes to you with anything else besides what God has said. Receive him not into your house. In other words, don't be friends with this person. Don't give this person hospitality. Because they're teaching false religious doctrine. Now, notice after this, neither bid him God speed. That means don't encourage them. Don't say, hey, you just keep doing what you're doing. Good luck to you. Hope things work well. You're encouraging their sin. Just don't do that. Why not? Look at verse 11. 
For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. This is not my opinion. This is what God said. So God said, if somebody else is committing a sin, whether it's homosexuality, whatever it is. Again, let's say that somebody feels like, well, I should have a right to go out and steal my neighbor. I know he keeps a lot of money in his house. And so I think I should go and steal that. And if I tell this person, yeah, you know what? You're right. You probably should go steal that guy's money. You want to come help me? Well, no, I, I don't really want to steal myself. But yeah, man, you should go. Yeah, good job. You should go do that. That's what he's talking about. So God says, if I do that, I'm just as guilty as the guy that breaks into the house and steals the money. I'm just as evil and sinful as he is because I encouraged him to do it. I told him there was nothing wrong with it. Oh, you can steal. It's okay. So God is condemning homosexuality, but the Pope is saying, well, you can live that lifestyle. It's okay. So according to God, the Pope is a partaker of their evil deeds. He is just as guilty, even though he's not practicing, as far as I know, homosexuality himself, but he's just as guilty because he's promoting it, convincing a lot of people that it's a-okay, it's just fine. Don't worry, God's not going to be upset at all even though the Bible says that he is. Now, the good news is that a lot of the Catholic priests, they have come out publicly and they have condemned this papal decree. They are fighting against it. And I do applaud them for that. They have vowed to defy it because they have said, it is crystal clear that God does not accept this kind of behavior, so we as Catholic priests, we cannot accept it either. Well, they're right about that. And this is some of the guys the Pope is punishing. He's kicking them out. In other words, he's passing judgment on them, even though he said he couldn't judge. But these guys realize, and they have said, there's some really good quotes from some of them as well, they have said this directly contradicts what the Bible teaches, what God has said. There's no way around it. God said, don't do it. The Pope is saying, yes, it's not that bad. It's okay. You cannot reconcile those two things. So the silver lining to all this, if there is one, is maybe that some Catholics and even others, maybe they will begin to lose faith in that institution. Maybe they will realize that, hey, this is not really what God said, but the Pope is telling us one thing and God's telling us something else. Maybe they will tear themselves apart over this. And the good that would come out of that would be hopefully that some of these disillusioned people, we talked about people getting disillusioned this morning. Maybe some of these people will become disillusioned and maybe they will begin to seek the truth that we've talked about this morning and tonight. Maybe they will seek it because if they will seek it, what does that mean? Jesus said, you'll find it. You'll find it. If you're really looking for it, it's right here. You'll find it. So maybe some good can come out of all of this. May they realize that the doctrine that they have been taught all this time, that doctrine has come from men. It did not come from God. And I pray that they will recognize that and come to their senses. Now, you all can tell that I'm really angry about this. And we have talked about, because again, some people, and I know there, there will be people maybe that will watch this and I, I will get crucified over this. Well, this is just awful, you know, because we're talking, well, Jesus, it's a sin to get mad, is it? Jesus threw out the money changers with a whip. Why? Because they were blaspheming God. They were directly going against what God wanted to be done in his temple. And that's what I've done. I've shared these things with you today out of righteous anger. But I want you to know, I don't get any joy out of it. It doesn't make me happy to have to talk about these things. I want people to know my motive for doing this even though I'll be, if some people see it, I'll be raked over the coals. And that's okay. Because I'm on God's side. And if you want to persecute me for that, I'm in good company.
But some people will say, man, you're just a hater. You, you hate homosexuals. You hate Catholics. My motive for doing this is love. It is not hate. So many precious souls are being misled by this doctrine and others, either innocently like we talked about this morning or deliberately. They are being told they are in good spiritual standing when they are not. I don't hate homosexuals. I could stand before God and tell you that. I don't hate Catholics. I don't hate anybody that's teaching false doctrine. I love those people and, and the people listening to it. I love them. That's why these things have to be said. And if these words can encourage somebody to seek the truth, then it will have been well worth it. But it's done out of love. I've often used this illustration. If you're driving along in a car, having a great time, you're going to go around a curve. And I know that around that curve, the bridge is out. And there's a 500-foot cliff. But you look like you're having so much fun. Should I say something? Hey, wait, wait, wait. You're... I know when you go around that curve, you're going to go off that cliff and you're going to die. But you're having so much fun driving. Shouldn't I just let you continue on? Would that be love or would that be hate? If I love you and care about you, I'm going to do my best to stop you because you're racing to your own destruction. I may not be able to stop you, but I'm going to make the effort. If I wanted to show you that I hated you, I wouldn't say a word. Yeah, going around that corner is great. Go ahead. I'm going to watch you float right off that cliff. That's hate. I do this out of love because I love lost souls. I'm commanded to do that by God. And if I really love God, then I've got to love lost souls. And people have to wake up to the truth. Not man's truth, not the Pope's truth, not my truth. Biblical truth. Because if me or anybody else teaches you anything that's not in this book, then I am a false teacher. And I would need to be called out just like these people that I'm calling out. That's love. If I hated him, I just wouldn't say a word. Oh yeah, you just keep doing what you're doing, it's fine. And then on the day of judgment, they're looking at me, Mark, why didn't you say something? Oh well. And we can justify it all day long by saying, well, they're probably not going to listen anyway. Well, maybe they won't. But then that won't be my fault. That'll be theirs. <clears throat> then they're going to look at me and say, you know, Mark, you tried to warn me, but I wouldn't listen. That's a different thing than saying, why didn't you warn me? Because God's going to ask me the same question. Hey, why didn't you say something? Mark, you were preaching. Why didn't you stand up for what was right? Why didn't you? Well, if I didn't, what kind of answer am I going to have? I don't know. I just didn't want anybody to get mad at me. Can't do it. So this is done out of love. Uh, people will misinterpret, but I don't want to let people continue down the road to their eternal destruction. And you and I have to be in this fight together. Now, Franklin Graham, I want to close with this. He made another correct observation. He said that God wants to forgive our sins. He does. And we've read the scriptures. We know that to be true. God doesn't want to condemn anybody. And that includes homosexuals, whoever. God wants to forgive our sins. But Franklin Graham, notice he said, but we have to go to God. He's not going to come to us. We have to go to him. We have to go according to his plan. We have to do it his way. Not according to man, but according to God. I told you, I myself came out of false religious beliefs. I listened to that for a long time. I thank God that I was given time to finally open my mind, to finally seek the truth. And I can say from personal experience, that when I finally wised up 
and I sought the truth. I found it. Just like God said I would. And all these people can find it too. And that's, we of course we don't want to hate on them. We want to love on them. We want them to find the truth. Don't listen to Pope Francis or any other man that's taking you down a different road. They need to listen to the Bible because that's God's word. May God give us the courage to speak out for him and to try to teach the truth to as many people as we can reach. They may not listen, but let's make the effort. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to Become a member of the Lord's church and only God can add you. Nobody else has the authority to do that. You can be baptized into Christ. You can have your sins washed away. And God will add you to his church. We can do that for you tonight. If, on the other hand, you have fallen away from God for whatever reason, you've gone back into the world, maybe you've listened to false ideas. Maybe you thought you were in good shape, but now you realize you weren't. God wants you to come home. God doesn't, as I said, he doesn't want to condemn anybody. God wants everybody to be saved. We can pray with you and for you. And God has said, if you'll confess those sins and repent for them, that he will forgive you and you'll be cleansed and you'll be a faithful child of God again. So if you have a need, please come forward. As together we stand and we sing. Almost persuaded.
part we all need to remember. All that have been mentioned on the sick bed, all having hardships in their life, please pray a word of prayer for, for them. Remember them in your prayers, each and every, every prayer. Always remember, services on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Services next, Bible study next Sunday morning at 9.30, regular services at 10.30, and services again here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Find somebody with you if you can. We need to, we need to reach some souls. Please turn to number 46. Let's sign this. We'll have a call of time. Find the first part for this. We'll have a call of time. <coughs> Let's be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred mind in life to that above. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to be here today to worship you, listen to your word. We pray that you lead us. Cause us sick, want us to have the surgery. Pray that do your will and be healed. We pray that we're able to go out and bring God to His church, let the church here grow. Pray that you'll protect each one of us from all the evil and temptation. Go with us and give us the promise and 